what's astonishing about William Butler Yeats is the ability he had to remake himself. You know, if we had only the pre-1900 poems, he would still be a quite extraordinary poet. What makes him a truly remarkable poet was that into the 20th century, and particularly with uh, the situation in Ireland really be becoming the subject matter of his poetry, he was able to make sense not only of himself, but of this country that was coming into being. And that is generally thought to be the reason why, as he advanced, his poems became better. That's very, very rare in a poet. For every Yeats, there are 20 or 30 or 40 Wordsworths, i.e. poets who really disimprove as they continue. Yeats is one of the very, very few who was able to get better, put very crudely, as he continued. The early Yeats is... Um, really quite extraordinary. He was already engaged by the matter of Ireland. Much of it though was mythological matter, uh, the wanderings of Oisin. He was very interested in uh, the, the stories of the uh, Fena, of the character of Cú Hollan. Uh, and those, of course, were constants right through his, his work, but they changed uh, in, in their manifestations. Cú Chulainn, for example, after the Easter Rising, uh, became a, a somewhat different character in a Yeats poem. Uh, he was very interested early on in Indian philosophy. Uh, in uh, mysticism of various stripes. And one of the things that comes across actually from uh, R.F. Foster's great two-volume Life of Yeats is frankly what a, what a weird guy Yeats was. I mean, he believed in any number of completely crazy ideas. He was into uh, Madame Blavatsky, The Order of the Golden Dawn. He believed in fairies. He believed in this, that, and the other. And actually, one of the mysteries about Yeats is that he managed to write such wonderful poems out of it. It's, a, it's an indicator, perhaps, that uh, subject matter does not really matter uh, at all. Matter, subject matter, it doesn't seem to matter. So uh, the early poems, though, were very much off their time. They were late 19th century poems, of course, and they were musical, they were modest in their way, they were imagistic, and though Yeats had already separated himself from the pack, as it were, he was the king of the cats, as he described himself, he was nonetheless very much like the other cats around. With the 20th century, with the rise of modernism, which was a movement, of course, that he helped define and develop, things changed. Things changed really after the First World War. That was a decisive moment in the history of mankind, of course, and in the history of the arts. And what happened, put very crudely, is that we no longer lived in a world in which everything was simple, in which God was in his heaven and all was right with the world. Who knew, really, if God was in his heaven? A lot of people felt now that he wasn't. Most people could see that all was definitely not right with the world after the carnage of the First World War. And the fractured, the broken, what didn't add up became the norm. And that became the norm of what was reflected in the arts. So the arts poetry became, um, in T.S. Eliot's term, a heap of broken images. And in fact, that's the term that uh, Yeats uses himself um, later, later on in the circus, Animal's Desertion. He, he refers to the mound of refuse. So art was now made out of the 
ugly out of the wounded, out of the fractured. Uh, so Yeats was part of uh, that, that shift. It had happened, of course, in the visual arts, with Cubism, where everything was broken down to its elements, largely under the influence of photography, where we could actually see one frame followed by another and see that the world was made up of these um, discrete-ish units. So anyway, that, that was a major component in what uh, changed Yeats. And of course, how he changed poetry by responding to the change in the world. Yeats's system, uh, his way of looking at the world, is extremely complex. He set it down in a book called A Vision, and there he um, described his sense of how the universe worked, um, how history worked in its great cycles, um, how men and women fitted into history and how the time at which they were born, for example, uh, was uh, significant in their, in their being. He was into uh, astrology, uh, among so many other things, so many other uh, uh, areas of interest that he had. Um, so I suppose that to have some sense of his engagement with the cycle, for example, the notion of history been cyclical is useful when it comes to reading some of these poems, a poem like The Second Coming, for example, uh, where he sees this being a moment, the early 20th century, that, uh, that, that it reflects the moment at which Christ was born and that particular era uh, was launched. He, he, so some sense of that will explain also his um, image of the gyre, uh, the great uh, whirling, it's very hard to describe it without somehow enacting it like that, the great uh, um, whirling, uh, it's almost like a tornado, I suppose. Uh, it's tornado-like anyhow, as he perceives it. So it would be very difficult to understand um, a line like, uh, turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer without appealing to some extent to this structure that's somewhat beyond the poems. However, 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 I do believe that Yeats may be read very successfully without a sense of this kind of terrific um, philosophical system, religious system, historical system, actually one may get, I think, as much as one needs of the lines turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Uh, you know, from our realization that the word gyre is very like the word gyrate, for example, that, that we, uh, we can understand it, I think. You know, so much so much um, 20th century poetry in particular, though mind you it's true of earlier centuries, also the 17th for example, was comparatively difficult. And Yeats's poetry reflects that shift from a, the early lyric poems that were um, somewhat more accessible. They were based on, on ballads in many cases. Uh, they, were, they were very direct in their way to actually this somewhat more arcane, more difficult poetry that he wrote as, as he, as, as, as he uh, advanced and, and uh, went on uh, within his career. Now he wasn't writing difficult poetry just for the sake of being difficult. He, what he was trying to do was to be equal to the difficulty of his moment, the difficult of the difficulty um, the, in many ways, the incomprehensibility of the world that we find ourselves in 
in the early 20th century. And, you know, if it was incomprehensible then, what is it now? I mean, we, we've only got to think of how difficult it is for us to make sense of the most basic elements that surround us. We don't really know, many of us, how our cell phone works. It's a mystery. We don't really know how our hybrid motor car works. We don't really know how much of what happens and where our food comes from. So we're surrounded by uh, the incomprehensible. And trying to make sense of things is one of our greatest impulses, both as persons in history and as poets. Uh, we're all trying to do the same thing. So um, some sense, some sense of the scheme, as it were, that lay behind the poems, I think may be useful, but I don't think it's absolutely necessary. Poems, to borrow a phrase from T.S. Eliot, may communicate before they're fully understood. Just as we can get through life without actually understanding the innards of a cell phone. We can just use it and communicate. Yeats thought of himself uh, primarily as a dramatist. When he won the Nobel Prize, he uh, felt that it was primarily for his work in the theatre that he was being honoured. And in fact, I think that uh, that may well have been the case in Stockholm also. That's what they thought they were honouring him for. So, um, you know, it's interesting, I suppose, uh, to remark on the extent to which his plays are not, uh, what would one say, they're not to the forefront of our minds. Um, now, they, of course, they are produced. They are produced. But they're produced, um, I think it would be fair to say, um, almost as, I think they're viewed by many people, including many of those who produce them, almost as oddities. They're very, very different. Very different from what we think of. Uh, in uh, the early 21st century as viable theatre. They're not so different from what other poets, T.S. Eliot, for example, might have thought of as viable theatre. We don't see a lot of T.S. Eliot's plays on Broadway. But Yeats's plays were of a very particular cast. First of all, many of them are very short. And while there is nothing so wonderful as a work of art of any kind that is short. It's one of the great delights <laughs> about the work of art. You know, the fact is that very few people are going to go to see a play that lasts 15 minutes and then sort of, you know, get on, get on with the evening. So they're generally uh, presented um, as a series within an evening um, or perhaps at a festival um, of uh, what turns out to be a festival of short plays. They're very um, strange in their way because what he was attempting to do, of course, in many cases, was to bring together uh, aspects of Irish mythology, particularly the stories having to do with Cúchulainn, the great Ulster superhero, um, to bring together um, aspects of his story or the stories associated with him and then the Japanese theatre tradition of the No play in particular. So these plays were very stylized, very poetic, uh, sometimes in a faintly pejorative way. Poetic, in other words, not necessarily meaning something that's all that wonderful. And they're, they have a tendency, uh, being stylized, uh, I think, they have a tendency towards uh, being a little static for many tastes. But having said that, I think there's always something of, of interest uh, in, these, in these plays. And, you know, I think they're somewhat hidebound by the requirements for their production. It'd be very difficult to modernize a, a Yeats play, to do it in modern dress, as it were. Uh, 
you know, it's the form of the play and its content are very, very much of a piece, which of course is how it should be in some sense. There's no divisible, they're, they're indivisible. Um, but it does make, um, it does make, uh, what did one say, revisiting them a little difficult. Um, you know, one way I think of getting into the Yeats at Canon, though, on the theatrical front, is actually to go there via Beckett. I mean, I think Beckett's plays actually derive, certainly not totally, but substantially, significantly, from Yeats's plays. I mean, we know, for example, that in Waiting for Godot, there's a direct visual allusion to a Yeats play with this little leaf on a tree from Purgatory, I believe the Yeats play is. What might be interesting from time to time actually would be to see uh, a few more nights of short Beckett plays and short Yeats plays. That's something I think that I'm not, it probably has been done. But it might be a way, I think, to, uh, for audiences to actually find an angle of entry into some of these plays that I think are a little bit difficult right now. Like all great poets, one may enter the world of Yeats at almost any point in his career. Uh, I myself actually encourage students uh, to begin at the end uh, with a poem called The Circus Animal's Desertion, which actually is a little potted history of his career as a poet, uh, where he outlines the various stages of his interest, um, outlines the various aspects of his own uh, life as a, uh, a man uh, of the theatre, um, a man of business, management of men, as he describes it, and perhaps a woman or two also, um, theatre business management of men, where he describes uh, his own, uh, the arc of his own, his own career, uh, which of course, uh, began with the wanderings of Oshin, uh, whom he does, a poem that he describes in uh, a, a circus animal, the circus animal's desertion, and then moves right through the great uh, poems, uh, the poems that refer to significant moments in Irish history, Easter 1916, uh, through these uh, poems like The Second Coming, um, and uh, poems that, that um, are somehow, um, I don't know, they're, 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 they, they seem to come from some space beyond Ireland, um, beyond uh, the immediate, and somehow, somehow resonate um, very much beyond their moment and beyond their, their place. Uh, and then right the way through to his, uh, his, his later poems, which are raucous, rollicking, embodying what he describes as lust and rage, the crazy Jane poems, the little fragmentary poems that are very much of a piece with some of the poems that his poetic ancestor, for sure, Jonathan Swift, would have written. And I think one of the things about Yeats that's really truly remarkable is the, his variousness. His variousness. He was extremely effective in a wide range of styles and forms. And, uh, you know, he, it's as if he was acutely aware with, of something that poets, I think, need to be mindful of, which is that the poem really needs to find its own shape in the world. And far too often I think we see that shapes have been imposed on poems, that they've been predetermined, prescribed in some ways. The great thing about Yeats was that he, while, it, while there are forms that uh, recur, particular stanz egg patterns, for example, and he was a master of the great stanza, the stadium stands, as I uh, have described it elsewhere, um, for these huge, uh, great, 
public poems. Um, he um, he managed uh, to uh, to find on each occasion the mode that was absolutely appropriate to that poem. So that a poem might be two lines long, or it might be a hundred. When thinking about poetry of any sort, I think it's really useful to remind oneself of what the word poet means and what the word poem means. And they both, uh, they both have to do with the idea of making, of construction. And I often uh, encourage my students to uh, think of themselves as architects, as engineers, and indeed, and indeed, as construction workers. Because poems, however mysterious they may seem, however um, mysterious they are, and they are mysterious, are nonetheless constructed of words. And one of the great things about Yeats is that uh, one may actually sort of peel back uh, the layers and see uh, through the finished building almost the construction site. And indeed, there's an extraordinary book for anyone who's interested not only in how Yeats wrote his poems, but in how poems get written by anyone. A book called Between the Lines. It's edited, uh, written by John Stallworthy. And it's a book having to do with the manuscripts of Ye a number of Yeats's most significant poems. And one may actually see him very painstakingly, very slowly, very uninspiredly, uh, it turns out, very ploddingly, uh, in fact, which is great if one's trying to write poems oneself because you think, well, you know, if Yeats had such trouble with this, maybe it's not so odd that the rest of us have such trouble with it. But you can see actually how the poems are made brick by brick, brick by brick, two by four by two by four, stud by stud. Um, and, you know, he was a great, great technician. Um, he learned early on how to put poems together. Insofar as we may discuss, insofar as we may discuss ever actually learning such a thing, because the fact of the matter is that one has to learn on the job with each construction. One has to figure out what it is, in fact, that's being made. You know, it might be an office block, it might be a pagoda, um, it might be a, a hut uh, that's being built in the poem, and one's never really sure in fact, until it's built, it's one of the, the mysteries of it. So what he was uh, supremely skilled in, though, was bringing such components as one may bring from one circumstance to another, i.e. from the last time you built something that looked a bit like a hut, or the last time you built something that looked a bit like a temple, or the last time you built something that looked a bit like a bungalow, uh, from one circumstance to the next. So he was, he was uh, technically really um, very, 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 um, very, very significantly gifted. And, uh, you know, we, many poets coming after Yeats go to school with him, really. Um, one thinks of a an English poet like Philip Larkin, an American poet like Robert Lowell, who learned significantly from Yeats, for example, among many others. They went to school. The idea of going to school, of course, is, uh, is uh, one that uh, belongs to many poetic traditions, including the Irish tradition. And uh, Yeats was also interested in that, the bardic tradition, uh, where one actually went and learned these rather complex forms with their intricate uh, internal rhymes and their rhyme schemes. And by the way, Yeats is a rhymer, um, is, is uh, hard to beat.
I suppose that anyone who's attempting to write poetry in English in this era necessarily has to, in some way, um, take in Yeats's achievement. Perhaps, if one's feeling particularly reckless, maybe even in some way to take him on. Uh, that's difficult. That is very difficult because he's, he's massive. He's massive. And one of the ways in which many of us uh, deal with you know, this extraordinary presence um, is, is, to, is to avoid him and sort of pretend he's not there somehow and sort of, you know, get on with it and hope that, you know, um, no one will notice. <laughs> I suppose that one's own efforts are, you know, so, so below par. Having said that, you know, particularly I think if one's an Irish poet, uh, never mind writing in English anywhere, I think maybe there's some requirement uh, to take him on, not in, you know, not in a round of fisticuffs or wrestling, but to acknowledge, I think, what he had attempted to do. And I suppose it, it would seem strange, I think, not to give him, um, give a nod and a wink in his direction from time to time. Um, I, I must say, while it's disheartening in some sense to uh, think about you know a poet of that stature. Um, it's actually um, encouraging, also I think, to you know one wants to write as well as one possibly can, and I think on balance, on balance, it, even though one may fall far short and fail miserably, I think on balance, it's more effective to keep one's uh, ambitions for the poem and the poem's ambitions for itself to entertain those and to give them um, credit and house room um, to, to, to uh, you know, uh, not in some self-regarding way to, 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 to try to uh, be as good as yet, but to remember that someone has been as good as that and to, um, I suppose, hope against hope that one might come with, you know, somewhere, somewhere, somewhere uh, within the same rough uh, zone. We have to remember where Yeats began. He was born in 1865. He was brought up in an era when the most famous poet in English uh, was Tennyson. Um, so Tennyson is a big influence on him. The pre-Raphaelites uh, are a big influence on him also. Um, but I think he, he found himself going back somewhat to a slightly early, earlier era. And um, one of his two of his major influences, I suppose, would have been Dunn. He writes somewhere about dining with Landor, that's Walter Savage Landor, who would have been a contemporary or a near contemporary. And not so much read these days, if, if at all. In fact, most people probably haven't heard of Walter Savage Landor. What a great name. Uh, with Landor, I would dine at Journey's End with Landor and with Don. So John Don, of course, was a, a poet who was very meaningful to him. Swift, um, a number of poets from the Anglo-Irish tradition. Uh, they were all meaningful. But you know, uh, there is an aspect of influence that I think we do well to remember, particularly in, a, in a, an American context, and that is the American influence on Yeats. Yeats, I think, was a great fan of Walt Whitman. In fact, his father, I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying, had met Whitman along the way. Uh, on one of his, uh, John Yeats, on one of his sojourns in America. And one of the things, one of the things, interestingly to me anyway, uh, is the extent to which Whitman's idea that one could develop an American literature was actually very influential in uh, Yeats's uh, sense that one could develop an Irish literature. 
So, you know, influence comes from um, what might seem to be an, an unlikely enough place. Um, I mean, for example, one of his most famous poems, perhaps the most famous poem, um, The Lake Isle of Inish Free, is influenced heavily by Thoreau, by Walden. So he was well versed in, in uh, much American literature, both poetry, strictly speaking, and you know, um, philo philosophical writings. And um, I think that was really telling in his uh, engagement with the sense that uh, um, he could write uh, for a country that was coming into being, developing itself, uh, and in fact maybe even do it more successfully. And that actually is worth remembering also about Yeats. He writes somewhere that uh, one of the glories about Ireland, uh, of Ireland, is that it's a small enough place in which, he says, as I recall, one man, he's very fond of that phrase, one man, a man, um, may see through a project. That's the gist of, uh, of what he says. You get an idea, you want to build a theatre? We'll do it. Let's do it. We can do it. Um, we can manage it. And um, there's a manageability to, to the Irish um, scene, I mean, physically, metaphorically, that I think he found very attractive. And so it was easier in a way for him to see through the development of a native um, uh, Irish literature in a way much easier than it was for Whitman. It's so hard to know where to begin in terms of choosing a favourite poem from Yeats. I mean, he's one of those writers whose work somehow reinvents itself in one just as he was given to reinvent um, himself from poem to poem. One reads a poem thinking one knows it, this is my experience, and you, th and you read it again, you think, huh, I really hadn't read that poem at all. Or one reads a poem one has read in some sense, and knows in some sense, and right beside it is a poem that actually it's, one has never seen before. One, one must have seen it, but actually it's like finding it's like finding something uh, completely new. So, you know, I, I'm loath to choose a single poem, but I suppose if a single poem is what we're talking about here, I'd have to choose a poem, actually, that he had terrific trouble with uh, because it was, um, <laughs> it was, it was everyone's favourite. And I suppose if you gave a poetry reading, everyone was just waiting to hear him read uh, the Lake Isle of Inish Free. It was his signature tune, as it were. Um, you know, if he'd been in a rock band, it would have been the, the poem with which he'd have ended the evening for an encore. And uh, for that very reason, he resisted it himself. Um, and I resisted actually too, uh, for a reason that may seem a bit strange. It was one of the very first poems of Yeats that I, that I read, and indeed I read it aloud at a poetry reading competition, or fesh as we call them, a festival uh, over in Ireland when I was maybe, I don't know, eight or nine years of age. And uh, I'd worked it up for this festival. And uh, then I came, I don't know how, how I did, I must have done, you know, got second place or something in an era in which coming second was, you know, meaningful, where not everyone had to come first, and um, or maybe even third. And um, so I came home, and in the little local parish hall, I came back as this demi-semi-conquering hero, and I was asked to stand up and read the poem aloud, and I did, and I got stuck somewhere. There's a re repetition in it that uh, I just, I find myself tripping over. But anyway, I'll read it in any case, and it's the Lake Isle of Inish Free. I will arise and go now, and go to Inish Free and a small cabin build there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, 
a hive for the honey bee, and live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings. There midnight's all a glimmer, and noon a purple glow, and evening full of the linnet's wings. I will arise and go now, for always night and day I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore. While I stand on the roadway or on the pavement's grey, I hear it in the deep heart's core.